HVAC 360 is brought to you today by... It's summertime, and you know what that means. Ooh, ooh, I do. No more second job as a pandemic homeschool teacher. Well, that too. But it's also the season for the mini desktop daiquiri dispenser. That's right. All you working from home probably need this piece of USB-powered essential work equipment. And don't forget to write this beauty off on your taxes before you fire it up. You'll have delicious slushies in minutes. Fill up your favorite coffee mug for a professional appearance on those Zoom calls or throw caution to the wind because, of course, it's always 5 o'clock somewhere. Cool off today and order yours now. Welcome back, Matt Nelson here, your host for HVAC 360, helping you be the best and the brightest in the field of HVAC. I do that by delivering curated content for you to consume your way, when you want it, because, let's face it, we're all super busy and the last thing we need to do is plan our day around a webinar or seminar. So get your learning on and let me dish out some relevant HVAC information, some lessons learned, or maybe even a conversation which is the case this week with an industry expert. And if all that doesn't wet your whistle, you can always sign up for my weekly newsletter or subscribe to my YouTube channel. So what is up for this week? This week, uh, with June being the end of the school year and all, I thought I would dive into some more career choices for listeners and talk with the school director from the Perfect Technician Academy, uh, who is Dr. Thomas Mormon about what it takes to become an HVAC, HVAC technician or installer. Uh, you know, that brings, you know, really, he brings up a lot of good points in this interview, so uh, stay tuned. It's not, a, it's not especially long. Specifically, I like the one about the need for skilled trades. Um, also, that these careers are something you really can be proud of, and that I love his comparison uh, between the trade-off, between the trade route versus the college route uh, from a dollars and cents standpoint. So dive into the interview and get that information. Now, before I want to, uh, before we get on to the interview, I want to get on my soapbox for a second um, and just kind of point out a couple of things. I mean, this really kind of gets me amped up. Obviously, um, college is not for everyone, nor should it really be the goal for uh, a large number of people. I mean, do you just really want to waste forty thousand dollars? I mean, what is that worth it? And that's just kind of you know, obviously an arbitrary number. It could be way more if you're going to be uh, become a professional, um, and if you don't really know what you want to do. Uh, there are a lot of things out there that can cost a lot less and be more rewarding in the end. Um, you want to be able to understand that you need skills. So, and these skills can take a lot less time uh, than some might expect. Uh, if you want to go the trade route, uh, it could take, you know, like we had in the interview, it could take, you know, six weeks. It could take, you know, a couple of months. Um, it could take a year and a half, but that is a lot less time than a four-year degree. Even with some of the IT professionals out there, uh, you get hired based on the certificates that you have, not necessarily that you have a college degree. So, um, And most of those you can kind of earn online kind of as you go. So there's a lot of different routes out there in the professions, in the trades, in different, uh, in different occupations that you don't necessarily need the four-year degree for. Um, granted, there are a lot of barriers to entry. I think that's one of the things that you have to go in uh, to this decision of what path is right for you with an open mind, whether or not you need a four-year degree. If you're going to become an engineer, um, yeah, you want to be able to go to that ABIT accredited school uh, that's going to give you an engineering degree so you can go and take the next steps, uh, whether you want to become a professional engineer or whether or not you just want to work as a mechanical, electric, mechanical or electrical engineer, structural engineer, who knows. Um, obviously, if you're an architect, that's going to take a lot of schooling. Um, and you you can't be an architect without going through certain steps. Um, but again, there are a lot of steps 
that cost a lot less money and that take a lot less time to get and in the end are just as rewarding. Uh, really, I mean, the, the focus here is be the best that you can be um, in whatever route that you try and you go down uh, as far as a career path. Um, because you can be just about anything and be the best at it. You don't need the four-year degree to be the best at something. You just need to have that hard work, determination, and grit that gets you from point A to point B. You know, and another thing uh, before I get my, off my soapbox is that you want to be able to gravitate towards like-minded people in your field. Uh, you want to be able to make sure that you look out for people who, you know, want to become the best. You don't want to be hanging out with people that don't have that desire because that's going to drag you down. You know, you are the uh, combination of the, the five closest people you spend the most time with. Um, I've heard that said a number of times. I don't know who to you know, credit that to, but um, it is true. I mean, you all, you start to think of the same, you hang out with people, you know, if they're down and they're complaining and they're like, oh, this is, this is no good. Well, you know, you need to evaluate that. Maybe you need to be hanging around with different people. So, all right, that's my two cents on this interview. And uh, let's just cut to the tape with Dr. Thomas Mormon. All right, today we're going to be talking with Dr. Thomas Mormon, who is the school director for the Perfect Technician Academy. How are you doing today, Tom? I'm doing very well, thank you. How about yourself? I'm doing awesome. So, I guess, you know, tell me a little bit about the Perfect Technician Academy and a little bit about yourself. Sure. So the Perfect Technician Academy was founded by the Hobson family. They, they had an air conditioning business and still operate an air conditioning business. It's been a family business for many, many years. Uh, but they were having trouble hiring quality technicians. And so they started training technicians to hire. And as they were doing that, uh, they, other individuals started saying, hey, can you train some technicians for us as well? Uh, at one time, they partnered with one of the community colleges and later decided to become an independent school. And so about six years ago, in, in 2015, uh, they began, uh, they were approved by the state of Texas to be an independent school and became the Perfect Technician Academy. Uh, you know, they started out kind of small with about 40 students in the first year. Uh, this year, we're going to hit a little bit over 200 students. So the school is growing and moving in that right direction as far as what you want it to do. We've created partnerships with the school with uh, contractors all over the country. So in major markets like Atlanta, Las Vegas, Los Angeles, Phoenix, uh, we, we have partners all over the country, actually. And uh, by having these employment partners, these contracting partners, it allows us to place our students all over the country as well. And so that's a great benefit as well. So that's, that's kind of where the school started and why it's there and how it's serving the industry now. Uh, just a little bit about my background. Uh, it's kind of funny that I ended up here at a trade school, but uh, that was never my thought process coming in. I, I'm an educator by trade. I worked for the state of Texas for about 28 years in the higher education systems. I worked in the University of North Texas system uh, and primarily at the University of North Texas Health Science Center for 25 years as a vice president and a vice provost. Uh, and during that time, uh, you know, I thought, you know, a lot about medical education. That's all that I'm really focused on. That's what my background was on. Uh, I decided to retire from the state of Texas. And when the Hobson started, I was retiring. I've known them for a while. They approached me and said, hey, would you be willing to come and help us get this school moving forward? And so I stepped in uh, about a year ago. And uh, in this last year, we moved the enrollment from about 76 students to about 200 students so far this year. And that's the goal is to continue to grow the school but not just grow it, but grow it with quality. And uh, I, I told him when I came on board, I said, I, I don't want to come on board to a traditional trade school and the traditional trade school model where you enroll as many students as you can, you graduate 60% and you play 60%. I said, if we're going to do this, we're going to do it right. We're going to change the paradigm of what a trade school is so that it's doing a service for not only the individuals that come, but for the industry itself. And so our goal is that everybody that we invite to be a part of our campus, a student that comes onto our campus, we're going to commit to try to graduate 100% of those students and place 100% of those that graduate. Uh, we've been able to be in the uh, 90th percentiles in all those areas over the last year, 
and hope to continue that trend as we continue to grow and move forward. Now, I mean, obviously, you've, you've talked about trade schools. Um, are there any other options beside, uh, you know, like, you know, PTA or the trade schools to, to get into this uh, field? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, there, there's you don't have to have an EPA certification in order to start in the field. Uh, there's many kids that come out of high school, 18, 19 years old, that may start on an installation crew. Uh, one member of that crew, the lead of that crew, has to have their EPA license for that crew to work on the air conditioning system. Uh, but if you want to get into a management role, a lead role, uh, to really uh, find some the, the, the salaries that you'll make are much higher once you get that certification. And so that's our goal is to provide that certification. There's a variety of different training models out there. Uh, our training model is a six week intensive boot camp type program. You come six days a week for six weeks and we teach you everything you need to know and then get you out into the field right away making some money. Uh, there's community colleges that have programs that are much slower paced and may take a year to 18 months to do. Uh, there are other trade schools that will do it in a year. There's some that do smaller programs in two weeks, but I, I don't know in two weeks, you're going to get through the EPA certification, but you're really not going to learn a lot about the technical skills you need to be successful as a repair service technician. So uh, there's lots of different models and you just got to find what's going to fit for you and what's going to be the best move for you to get into the industry. And you're talking about getting in this industry too. A lot of people don't realize that the door is open to them to come into it. They feel there's barriers. Most people get into it because they have a family member or a friend who's already in the field and they pull them into the field once they realize the opportunities that are out there. So we're trying to create a better exposure and let more people know about the opportunities in the HVAC industry. So now I, I guess what any, any sort of tips that you would have for people trying to evaluate, you know, one way or the other, which, which may be the best route for them to evaluate the different options? Absolutely. So uh, for us, like the six-week program, we modeled it after the military training model where it's complete immersion into the uh, into the field. You learn it, you do it, and then you're ready to start teaching it. And, and that's the model that we take in that six-week intensive training program. It's really based after the military models. The person who designed our curriculum was actually a former Marine. Actually, yeah, you're never a former Marine. You're always a Marine. I know that. So uh, but the reality is, you know, he was a Marine, he's re left the Marines and he's going to develop the curriculum. He's been a master electrician. He's also a certified HVAC person as well. Uh, and so, you know, that's the model that we put forward. If you can do fast paced, you know, if you're coming out of the military, you're going to be used to that kind of model. That's a great model for you. Uh, if you struggle with uh, the pace of learning and need a little extra time, you know, the community college route is a good route for you because they're going to have a slower pace. They're going to go through things a little bit easier and at a pace that may be better for you. So you've got to understand your learning style, your aptitudes, and figure out which one's going to be the best for you. If all you want is a certification, you can go to a two-week program, get the certification. Uh, then you can jump into the field. You'll probably still have to serve uh, a year or two at least uh, as an installer, an installer crew, uh, in order to then learn enough to use that certification effectively. So you, you got to figure out what, what's best for you. A lot of people, uh, they don't have a lot of time that they can be without an income. So a two week program may be better. A six week program may work. Uh, a 12 month program may not work if they can't be without an income. If they do have a funding source, say for a GI bill or for our program where GI bill approved so they can use their VA benefits to come to school here. Most community colleges, that'll be the case too. Some of the two-week schools, that may be the case, but not necessarily. So you need to check on all those things as uh, what's going to fit best for uh, affordability for you and into your lifestyle and into your learning style. Now, you talked about when you when you get out of the, the, the Perfect Training Academy or the Perfect Technician Academy. Um, you talked about, you know, you'd be able to not, per place, uh, or place 90% um, ish uh, of the people that graduate from your uh, academy. So what, talk a little bit about the demand out there in the United States. Uh, well, actually, uh, according to the Department of Labor Statistics, uh, the HVAC industry or the air conditioning, heating, ventilation industry is growing at a faster pace than most other fields. It's about 13% increase every year. Uh, and so there's a great demand. Right now, if you go on Indeed and you type in HVAC jobs nationally, you'll probably get between 
30,000 and 60,000 jobs. Now, before COVID, uh, it was 66,000 jobs. Today, it's probably more in the 20 to 30,000 range just because uh, things are getting back started up again. But the reality is most air conditioning companies never stop working throughout this crisis. Uh, air conditioning and heating is considered an essential service. Uh, we know more people are spending time at home right now because of uh, the COVID issue. And if they're at home more often, that home environment needs to be comfortable. And so uh, we had about a two week period when COVID started that people kind of stopped calling. And after they started spending a lot of time at home, those calls started coming in because they want to be comfortable at home. So the HVAC technicians that I've talked to around the country, uh, you know, they're as busy as they've ever been. And so the industry itself is, it's a constant, it's, it's you know, there's some seasonal things as far as the South heat, uh, heat in, or, you know, in the winter, the heat's not as important as the, the cool in the summer. And up North, it's kind of vice versa is the heat in the summer is not as important as the, or the cool in the summer is not as important as the heat in the winter. And so those are things that, uh, you know, you just need to know as far as the industry. But the reality, I talked to one guy just recently that uh, he, he's 19 years old. He came to our school, got his certification. Uh, he works all summer, saves the money, and he pays for his college completely by the m money he makes during the summer. And so he goes to college fall and spring and then works all summer as an HVAC technician. He's done it for two years and he has no debt, no loans for college. So you got to figure out how it's going to work for you as you go into the industry. Now, I think that, you know, as, as far as the people that I've talked to, um, you know, it, even in the commercial world, there really is – there's, you never at a point where you're not looking for qualified individuals, um, you know, especially qualified individuals who are willing to put in the work. Um, so I think, yeah. you know, obviously that translates into technicians as well. So tell, Absolutely. So tell me a little yes. bit about, uh, you know, people might be interested, hey, you know, what does a technician make, you know, right out of school? What does a technician make maybe long term? Uh, what are the earning potentials for them? Yeah, so... It varies around the country, but if you go again to the, as a, a state school, and uh, we're funded by the state of Texas, I can only quote uh, the Department of Labor Statistics when it comes to the money. So according to the Department of Labor Statistics, the uh, median salary is about $23 an hour for the United States, and it's about 48000 a year for a technician that's coming out of a program. Um, you know, we, we see that. Uh, I, I recommend that people go out. If you're interested in this industry, go and talk to some of the technicians out there. Because uh, if you're willing to work hard, put in the effort, and, and really go at it, uh, in the residential sector, you can make a whole lot more than that. And so I, I would recommend that people go and talk to some of the employers, talk to some of the people, and, and see what that is. Uh, the, the Department of Labor Statistics takes into account all of the commercial, which uh, – don't have any commissions, all the, it's a variety of all the technicians from the base and smaller all the way up to the top uh, technicians. So uh, it's an average in that regard. So you got to keep that in mind when you start looking at the technician salaries. Uh, but I guarantee you someone who's willing to work hard, put in the effort, put in the time, they're going to make a very good living for their family. So what are some of the myths and, and common mi misconceptions that people have about this type of career? Uh, I think one of the biggest misconceptions that people have is that uh, it's a minimum wage job that they're going to come in and they're going to, they're going to have to work really hard and they're not going to get paid very much. And uh, there's not a lot of room for advancement and not a lot of opportunity. And, you know, that's really just not true. The reality is, is that the harder you work in this industry, the more money you make, uh, the, the more quality work you do, the more calls you can go on, the more efficient you the more efficient you work and the more quality work you do, you don't have to go back to a call. Uh, you, if you do that well, uh, you can really make a lot of money. And it's just up to that individual effort. Uh, and there's lots of opportunities from being on an installer crew to a lead installer to a maintenance technician to a service technician to a sales representative uh, to sales managers and on and on and on. There, there's lots of opportunities within this field and people don't realize that. And very few of them that uh, at the lower end, the installer and the maintenance guys uh, may be more towards some of that minimum wage salary initially, if that's where you enter. But uh, if you're moving into the service technician, the, the crew lead and other areas like that, uh, you know, that you're really going to be doing well. And for our school, that's really our focus is trying to train people to go and be uh, residential installer, 
not not just installers, but the service technicians, so that they can go out and drive a van independently for a contractor and go into someone's house and service that unit completely independently, and then set sales leads if that's what needs to happen, if they need a new unit, things like that. So, uh, you know, that's really what we're training for. So now I, I, I think, you know, some people might not necessarily understand um, the difference between being a technician and being an installer. I mean, you've kind of kind of gone around the issue a little bit. Um, is, is there any more detail that you can provide? Sure, absolutely. A uh, technician is going to have to have a lot more knowledge because the technician is going into that home and you have to know about all the different types of units, uh, heating, cooling, ventilation, airflow, and you need to go in and be able to diagnose something and fix it. Uh, an installer is taking new equipment and they're just putting the pieces together in the right shape, form and everything so that it's in the house. The crew, the lead crew installer, now that person has to understand the airflow and things. So you install the vents and the return air and everything in the right way. You understand the capacity of the air, the house, the airflow in the house, uh, the static pressure pieces that, to make sure you do the unit correctly when it's installed. But the average installer, they're just following the instruction manual of, you know, X to Z to to Y and put it into the house and there it is. Uh, and you know, you may be doing new construction. So it's a brand new house that no one's ever lived in, or you may be coming into someone's house after uh, a service technician has gone in, tried to repair the unit, said this can't be repaired or you can repair it, but uh, it'd be better to replace it at the age that it is, or it's an old R22 unit and you really need to move to the new technology because you can't get R22 uh, free on anymore, uh, things like that. And so they may set the lead and then the installers will come in and install the new unit. So the level of knowledge and skill that you have to have as a technician is much greater than what you have to have as an installer. So, so why would, why would you know, obviously you offer both kinds of courses uh, at your academy. Why would, why would somebody prefer to be an installer over a technician? Uh, well, someone who's new coming into the field. So we have some people that will come to our school right out of high school. Uh, you know, if you go into it right out of high school, uh, if, depending on the maturity of that individual, uh, there are some 18, 19 year olds that can walk into a house and garner trust with uh, the homeowner, but that's not going to be as likely. Uh, you know, typically a homeowner is going to want someone that has some more experience or seems to have more experience. So an 18, 19 year old, they may be better to start out on an install crew, uh, learn how to manage the equipment while they're on that install crew, challenge themselves to do some other repair type stuff, uh, work in the shop, do some training, learn the things you need to learn so that you can get to that level and then eventually move into uh, a technician role as well. But there's other people that really just don't have that technical acumen. Uh, they're good at following instructions and putting things together. Well, it's a great career for you. I mean, uh, the reality is we're putting air conditioning systems every day and it's going to continue and it's not going to go away. Uh, we talk about global warming. Uh, I guarantee you as things get hotter, people are going to want to stay cooler. So uh, the industry is going to continue to grow. And, you know, if, if you feel that you're good with your hands, but you don't really like the technical side, the wiring, the electrical, then, uh, you know, you could go and be an installer and it's, going to be a great opportunity for you. Now, do do they, uh, do you have, you know, as far as uh, the different companies who are, are hiring people out of your academy, now, are they, you know, sometimes uh, going to be just like contractors, like installing contractors, you know, looking for those uh, installers? Yeah, most, most of the contractors we work with do more than just AC as well. Uh, and they don't just do installation. The installation is going to be one part of it. So, uh, even if you are a service technician, you may work on some installations when the, when, you know, depending on the crews and when things are busy, you may go and help out with that installation as well, because there's going to be some things that, uh, when you come to the wiring of the unit or other things that they may need your expertise on some areas. But the reality is that, uh, most air conditioning contractors will do everything from, uh, the residential to commercial air conditioning systems. They will do plumbing as well. Uh, some of them will even do uh, major electrical. So you may go in and work for this company doing HVAC service technician stuff. But while you're doing that, they may be able to offer training in electrical and plumbing and other things as well uh, because they're all connected. I mean, the reality is an HVAC system, you're going to have drain lines that you need to attach to. So you're going to be working with plumbing. You're going to have electrical systems that you need to tie into. I mean, all those things are going to be a part of it. 
And so many of these companies branch out into not just air conditioning, but into other areas as well. So it, it creates more opportunities for you to move on, uh, gain certifications and things as well in other areas. Excellent. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, th- I think a lot of people, you know, they need to understand that, you know, trades, like you kind of said in the beginning, this is not, this is not your minimum wage job. This is not being a laborer. Um, you know, that is, you need to be able to use your head. You need to be able to, you know, analyze a system, uh, help out, you know, have teamwork, work together, um, get things, get things put together right the first time. So there's a lot of things that go into, you know, being a good technician or installer. Absolutely. Yeah. So I guess what uh, can you kind of describe maybe somebody um, who, you know, I mean, we're kind of talking around, um, you know, working for a company that, you know, has potential, has other avenues. Can we kind of maybe uh, uh, talk a little bit about some of the different career paths or advancement opportunities um, for people who might be, uh, you know, getting into the uh, getting into the field? Sure. So. I mean, someone who's coming in, if they come in as uh, a member of an install crew, uh, they, they may do that for a year or two, uh, you know, work themselves into a, lead, a crew lead where they get their EPA certification and now they're leading a crew of installers. And so they'll go and do that for a while. Uh, you know, I know people that that's, that's all they ever wanted to do. And so once they became a crew lead, that they stayed as a crew lead for installation because they love installation. Uh, I know others that have moved on and said, okay, uh, I enjoy this, but I really want to make a little bit more. I want to do some of the sales piece. So they'll go into the uh, service technician side. Uh, the service technician side is where you're going to be driving a van independently. You're going, you're traveling around a lot, moving from place to place. You may make five, six, seven, eight calls in a day and go to different places and, and do minor repairs to major repairs. Uh, the install crew if they may do one, maybe two installs a day, uh, it'd be rare that they would do three installs in a day because of the time that it takes to, to install a complete unit and everything, depending if they're doing new duct work or no, not doing new duct work. I mean, all that makes a difference. But uh, you also have the maintenance technician. So someone who uh, we sell maintenance agreements to go and just uh, do checkups and clean people's units out and just keep them operating the most efficiently. If you get dust buildup on your blower, uh, it's going to slow down the performance. So they just go in and they clean the equipment. They do all those kind of things. Uh, you know, that's more, you know, I've gotten tired of doing uh, all the maintenance stuff and doing that. I want to slow down. I want to do something a little bit more straightforward. They may go into the maintenance side and just really thrive at that, going in and just cleaning up people's units, uh, doing the regular maintenance that needs to happen uh, at the beginning of the winter and the beginning of the summer. Every year you should have that maintenance done. And so, they'll, they'll, you know, there's people that that's all they do. So there's different opportunities there. And uh, the other is, you know, if someone becomes good at selling and that uh, uh, when it comes time to make those sales for the new units, you know, they, they'll go in and there'll be people that specialize just in that area that go once a, a lead set by uh, one of the repair technicians, uh, they'll send over the sales rep and the sales rep will meet with the family and kind of talk through uh, this is what it would cost to repair the unit. So this is the, what you can do to do that if that's what you choose to do. If that unit's no longer under warranty, so you may want to consider a new unit because you'll come with a warranty other things. Uh, also, if it's an R22 unit, we want to kind of get rid of those. The federal government wants those gone. So what we can do to uh, create a more efficient unit in your house, save you on your energy bills, we can talk about that. So there may be a second issue that this, this is a, a lower end model that you can do or this is a higher end, more efficient model that you can do and we'll give them options of what they can do. So the sales side is going to be someone that goes in and really is more of an educator to the consumer to allow them to make the best decision financially for their family and uh, for the comfort of the home that they want to have, what they want to achieve. So there, there's all different levels. And then you get into the, the sales managers that are in the office that are running the crews or uh, distribution guys who are back there, you know, ordering the equipment and managing the, the distribution of the equipment to each of the trucks and each of the job sites and things like that. So th- there's a wide variety. And then we talked about some of these contractors have multiple businesses. So they do plumbing, electrical, and HVAC. So you may be working as an HVAC, HVAC technician under a master plumber uh, and working with them. And you may go and do some work on plumbing sites as well. Well, in the state of Texas, you have to do an apprenticeship and a journeyman and all the things to, to become a master plumber. 
Well, you can work under them and eventually achieve that opportunity as well. And where you can become a master plumber and have your HVAC certifications as well. So when you work for these contractors that have multiple avenues, uh, the door is even wider open for you to explore more career opportunities in air conditioning, but in plumbing, electrical, uh, and on. Wow, that's a, that's very exciting. You know, I mean, to have to have all those options, and that's that's really what you want to be able to to do as somebody who's looking to to start a new career is you want to have as many options as you can for uh, for your future. And uh, obviously, this is this is one of the career paths that actually does it. Now, I know that that you have, you know, you really, you know, since you mentioned the uh, um, the uh, course was being developed by a marine, you have a lot of um, that that's a big push for you. Um, why do you think it, it, it's such a good fit for anybody who's coming out of the military? Well, one, uh, the people coming out of the military, they, they understand the importance of respect. They respect authority. They respect the homeowner. They respect people's property. Uh, and, and that's a big part of the military training, that discipline. They clean up after themselves. They, they don't leave a mess when they leave a homeowner's site. Uh, you, you compare the civilian, the, you open up the back of two service trucks, one for someone who went straight into it from a civilian standpoint and someone who came out of the military. And every time that military truck's going to be organized, neat, and detailed. And all of those things make a difference. When you talk about building trust with customers, because that's where your long-term programs are going to come from. That's where you know people are going to call you back is if they trust you. And uh, these military guys, when they come out, they instill a sense of trust in people that others don't seem to do as easily because uh, one, their service, uh, people are thankful for that service Two, they're a little bit more mature. So when they go to talk to the homeowner, uh, there's already a sense of, Hey, these guys know what they're talking about. Uh, Many of these military guys, like I I was at Fort Bliss talking to some infantry guys and he's saying, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do when I get out of the army. Here I am. I work on Patriot missile systems. No city in the United States needs a Patriot missile system. And I laughed and I said, now tell me a little bit about that Patriot missile system. Does it have a cooling system in it? Well, yes. Does it have a GPS system? Well, yeah. Does it have electricity that runs through it? Yes. Radar systems? Yes. I said, so you can repair that. Well, absolutely. I said, I guarantee you, if you can repair that Patriot missile system, I can teach you how to repair a home air conditioning system because it's much less complicated than that. And so they have these technical skills that they just need to transfer into this industry. And it transfers very easily, very smoothly. And they, they pick it up and they do very well. They, they have the technical acumen to really be successful. And our training model, they respond very well to it because it's the same training model they went through to learn how to maintain that Patriot missile system. Uh, you know, and, and so the reality is it's a great opportunity to come into an essential industry And uh, they they just have this sense about them. They're clean cut. They know how to wear a uniform. Uh, You know, all these things that make you successful in this industry, they're coming into it already knowing a lot about. Wow. It's a part of their character already. Yeah. Yeah. That is really awesome. So we've talked a lot about a lot of things. Is there anything that we didn't cover that uh, you think people should know more, more about? Absolutely. So, you know, my background was higher education. My doctoral degree is in education. I've worked in higher education in the state of Texas for 28 years. I retired from the state recently and came to, to the trade school. And uh, you know, one of the things as a college vice president and administrator, what I saw quite often were students that came to the university that didn't really want to be there. They were going through the motions because they felt they had to be there. I also, there are a lot of people who just didn't, didn't really like being in class. And didn't enjoy that classroom environment. And so they didn't thrive. They didn't succeed as well. Um, And one of the pieces of that puzzle is, is you go to a university and you start taking out loans to go, Uh, uh, you know, the average debt right now coming out of undergraduate is probably $30,000, somewhere in that range. But some people could go to a private school, they're taking out a hundred thousand dollars in loans to go to that private school and get that education. Um, And what we see is they go to school for four years. They come out of, of school with debt and they come into a job. Did you know the average college graduate makes about $47,000 a year coming out of school? Now, if you're engineering, it may be close to 80, but the average is about 47,000. And so you take that, you say, okay, you lose four years of income because you're in school. You have debt when you come out at six to 8%. 
as the student loan debt. And then uh, you're making $47,000 a year. So come to a trade school, whether it's ours or others, uh, it may cost you $15,000 to come to that trade school, somewhere in that range, somewhere up to 18, 20,000, but we're right at 15. You're done in six weeks. So in, after six weeks, you start earning a salary in that salary range, 40 to $50,000 a year. And you make that salary for four years. So you've already made $200,000 while the other person was in school and they have another $40,000 in debt. So they're behind a year in earnings. So you're already made $250,000 by the time they've paid off any of their debt and are moving forward. The reality is don't discount trade schools because the opportunity to make money with minimal investment, minimal debt is going to help you be successful in the long run. I know many 28 year old guys who have come into this industry and been successful and they're making more money than the family physicians that I trained while I was uh, working at the medical school. So, you know, there's lots of opportunities and I, I think people just need to consider all those options. We've kind of made trade schools a taboo or the trades a taboo in this country. Uh, and the reality is working with your hands and putting in a hard day's work, uh, there's a great benefit to that and it can create a very lucrative opportunity for you and your family. So that, that's where I'll end it. That's, that's a, that's, that's very well put. Thank you. Thank you for that input. And, you know, thank you for taking the time, Tom, to, uh, to talk to us about, you know, the careers in, uh, HVAC and being a technician installer, what have you, but, uh, I really do appreciate it. Uh, it's been my pleasure. You have a great day. All right. Thanks so much to Dr. Warman for taking the time out of his busy schedule to come and chat with us on HVAC 360. And a special thank you to you, the listener, for taking the time and listening. I hope this was helpful. I hope you learned something. Uh, and if, uh, as always, show notes can be found over at HVAC360.com slash 164 for this particular episode. All right. Uh, if you know somebody who's looking to step up their HVAC game, consider sharing this episode or one of your other favorites uh, with them. This is really by far the best thing you can do to spread the word about this podcast. If you are hungry for more, go over to HVAC360.com and sign up for the weekly dose of the written word or browse on my YouTube channel and subscribe if video is more your liking. All right. Lastly, it would be greatly honored if you would consider leaving me a rating review on Apple Podcasts, that is still by far the best way uh, that you can help me, aside from sharing this episode, really uh, uh, to, to get it noticed uh, and to make sure that people understand, give it that social proof that this is something that's worth listening to, and I certainly hope it is. All right, well, that's a wrap for this episode of HVAC 360. I'm Matt Nelson, helping you be the best and the brightest in the field of HVAC. And as always, know what you build and share what you know. <laughs>